I really have a message from the Lord today, and I am very excited about the word that I'm going to deal with. I think it's one of the most significant words in all the Bible. If this one doesn't light you up, your wick is wet. The title of this message is, What is Grace? What is grace? You know, basically, there are three questions that we're trying to answer in the realm of religion. What is God is like? How can we know him? And what, if anything, does he want us to do? What is God like? How can we know him? And what, if anything, does he want us to do? Well, I believe grace covers every one of these questions. So what I'd like to do is to go through the biblical usage of grace and then get a definition and then apply it to the situation of our lives. Now, first of all, grace is used in the Old Testament in a very limited sense. That's pretty surprising to me. There is one Hebrew word that's very close to what we use uh, the word grace for. It's the word hen, just like a chicken, a hen. And it means favor or thankfulness or pleasantness or that kind of thing. And so when the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament was done about 250 B.C. called the Septuagint, this little word that we're used to in the New Testament, charis, was used to translate that word. But that's not at all the way we use it in the church. We, when we say grace, we don't mean just favor or pleasantness or thankfulness. We have a specialized meaning. And the closest Old Testament word that comes to the way we use the word in the church is a little word called hesed. If you have a King James Bible, it's called mercy. If you have New American Standard, it's called loving kindness. It is that special covenant verb that verb that's used to describe that unique and wonderful relationship between Yahweh and Israel. I've often defined it as God's covenant, no strings attached loyalty. Now that's getting closer to what I think of when I think of grace. But the word's just not used much in the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, it surprises me some that in secular Greek, the meaning is much like the Old Testament. It means favor or thankfulness or pleasantness. Aristotle defined the word grace like this. Helpfulness toward someone in need, not in return for anything. Helpfulness for someone in need, not with thinking about what we get back. Well, now this begins to take on the connotation of helping someone that has no possibility of paying you back or helping someone undeserved. Now, with this in mind, as we go to the New Testament scriptures, it's going to be surprising to us. It was really surprising to me that the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark never used the word grace in a noun or a verb one time. Isn't that surprising? All of Matthew, all of Mark never used the word grace. Not even once. The Gospel of John only uses the word grace three times. And every one of them are in verse 14, 15, 16, and 17 in chapter 1, the prologue. Even John does not use the noun or the verb grace. Wow. Wow. Did you know the verb is only used, the noun I mean, four times in the Gospel of Luke, and every time it's used, it's used in the sense of favor or thankfulness. Well, doesn't that surprise you that one of the main line biblical theological terms is not used by Jesus? The Gospels record Jesus' words and teachings, and Jesus did not discuss extensively the concept of grace, at least in that category. Isn't that surprising? Where do we get the concept of grace from? Who? Paul. Our use of grace is totally Pauline. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think it's Paul 
was on the Damascus Road, something happened to him that he could just not explain in any other way uh, than a brand new kind of a word. Now, he used a word that was in use, and he used a word that had the connotation of helping someone without thought of getting something in return, and I think he picked up on that. It's, It's interesting to me to note that Paul uses the word grace as John uses the word agape or love. What John's doing with love, Paul's going to do with grace. Now, what does it mean? Well, here was Paul, a bright light in the rabbinical schools, a student of Gamaliel himself, zealous for putting down this new heretical sect called Christians, on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus with a letter from the Sanhedrin to persecute and kill and take the property of more of these followers of the way. And as he was going to Damascus, a bright light shone and knocked Paul to the ground. And a voice out of heaven spoke and said, Paul, or it was Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's difficult to kick against the goads. And Paul said, who is it? And the voice said, this is Jesus. Woo, friends, something happened to the Jew right then. (laughs) That boy got up different than he ever went down, I want to tell you. Because, you see, Paul, here he had been persecuting the church. I think he had had some Christians killed. We know he was present at Stephen's martyrdom, and I think he got the taste of blood, and he was going to be zealous for the law. Boy, he was just ripping and snorting over Christians. Matter of fact, he calls himself the chief of sinners and the least of the saints because he said, I persecute the church. Lo and behold, a man like this, breathing fire against the people of God, killing some, and the founder of that new sect appears to him in a marvelous act of grace and redeems his life. Now, Paul is not able to get away from this. First of all, that God would love him. You know, I've talked about it several times recently, and and I guess I'm just caught up in the excitement of it. But you know, how you view God will determine your understanding of yourself and your salvation and all the rest. Paul was absolutely flabbergasted that God would love him. Now, you know, I don't know what your concept of God is, I think many people see God as a probation officer that if you really toe the line for X number of years, then he'll let you in. Or as an umpire who's always out deciding if it's this rule or that rule or you're out or you're disqualified. Or some vengeful judge just waiting for you to step out of line. Well, Paul's view of God was just shattered when in the midst of his rebellion against the church that Jesus died to start, God in mercy reached down and redeemed that radical Jew's life. Now, Jesus has told us that God is like a loving father, but most of the people I talk to still think that they've got to do something for God to love them or that God's basically mad and they've got to do something really super to get his attitude changed. One of the greatest truths that Paul ever learned was when God dealt with him in the midst of his rebellion in love and acceptance. Second thing I think Paul learned, which answers, I think, the second part of that question is, God initiated his love. You know, I get... I get tickled at us. We think John 3.16 is a verse about Jesus. John 3.16 is a verse about a loving God. And not only a loving God, but God starts the process. No one has ever come to God. Paul had searched God for all of his life. He had the Talmud and he had a rule for everything and he had so structured his life, he was a sincere, committed, enthusiastic young rabbi. He had done everything so God would accept him. And in the midst of his going in the opposite direction, God burst into his life. Friends, I want to tell you, no one of us is seeking God unless God calls him first. 
Isaiah would put it this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned unto his own way, and not one has sought after God. Uh, John 6, 44 and 65 would put it this way. No one comes under the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. You do not choose the day that God breaks into your life. God chooses the day. And the picture that's so meaningful to me about God is not that he's a reluctant person who just doesn't want to mess with us, that we're just sinful people. He just wants to wash his hands of the whole thing. God is on your trail, friend. And any time you're willing to turn around anywhere you are, you'll find God looking you in the eyeball saying, I love you. I want you to know me. I will not give up on you. I will not leave you for forsake you. You cannot run from me. You go as high as the heavens. You go as low as hell. You go as far as the east is from the west. And you'll find a loving God right on your doorstep. That's a hallelujah right there, isn't it? So here's a God that's basically a God of love and acceptance and a God that will not give up on his fallen creation. Paul learned that on that road. And finally, the thing that just wiped Paul out, I think, is that Paul learned that he was accepted totally apart from what he did. Now think what I'm saying. God loved him and accepted him totally apart from anything that Paul did or could do. There are some miserable Christians who are still trying to be right with God with their own efforts. And that's good if you got a good week. If you had a real good week, a real religious week, or, you know, you did some real good religious things and everybody's saying, woo, but boy, I got some bummers of some weeks. Do you? Deliver me from my ability to please God. I want to show you in the scriptures. You ought to write this down. This, this is the first part that will light your wick right here. Salvation is totally unrelated to human merit or effort. Romans 11, 6. This is one of four. Romans 11, 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, that no one should boast. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according, look at this, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. And then Titus chapter 3, verse 5. But he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be unto God, we have a God that is for us, a God that is with us, and a God that's provided our every need in Jesus Christ. Woohoo! Hallelujah! Glory! We have a God that is on our side. Now that's a brand new word that we need to hear. We're not trying to get a sweet, loving Jesus to placate an angry Old Testament God. We've got a Father that loves us, is for us, is on our side. And then all the rest is bonus. Woo-hoo! I didn't go up and smoke right here. This basic understanding hit Paul like a light on that Damascus road is really the answer to those three questions I talked about. What is God like? How do we know him? And what, if anything, does he want us to do? The first response here is, God loves all men. I don't know who you are. But I know one thing about you. Your daddy loves you. He loves you. And you can't get so far if he don't love you. And he loves you enough to send his only son to die in your place. God loves you. I want to give you a couple of verses. Because when, when the Ed read Romans 5, if you want to look at 17 and 18, talks about God's love. I think one of the most beautiful ones that I know about is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to this. But we do see him who's been made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, 
that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. Oh, what a beautiful one. There's another one, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. I don't know what kind of problems you've got, but the one problem I know you don't have is God doesn't love you. You don't have that problem because he loves every one that he's created in his image. Now, the second one, how do we know God? What is God like? He's like a loving father. How do we know him? The only way we know him is through either the written word or the living word. And right now I'm focusing primarily on the living word, which is Jesus Christ. And the word that comes so clearly in Jesus Christ is that Paul learned so clearly in the Damascus Road is this. Knowing God is a free gift. Do you believe that? I mean, really, honest to goodness, do you believe that being saved, knowing God, being right with God, going to heaven, being part of God's family, living for eternity is an absolutely no strings attached, 100% free gift? <laughs> we don't act like it, do we? Now, there's another part to this, but I want to tell you, salvation is absolutely free in the grace of God. You say, you got a few verses? I think I got one or two. Write these down. Free gift. Romans 3, 24, 5, 15 through 17, 6, 23, and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By a free gift of his grace. And finally, what does God want us to do, if anything? He wants us to trust his son. He doesn't want us to be all excited and goosebump and find out how close we are to the Lord by how many goosebumps we have. He doesn't want us just to know theology to find out how close we are to the Lord by what kind of theology test we can pass. He doesn't want to check our attendance record at church to see what kind of Christians we are. He wants us to trust his son. If I could use a, an Easter metaphor, <laughs> this is going to be bad. He wants us to put all of our eggs in his basket. Don't keep any of them in yours. There is in you dwelleth no good thing. Everything we have is from a loving God as a free gift through the mediation, the life, the death, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know what you can do for God? Woo, woo, woo. You can't do anything for God. All you can do is accept what he's already done for you. Now, once you accept it, there are great things ahead, but you can't start without accepting what he's already done in his son. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. You can't make it better. You can't make it relevant. All you can do is transfer your trust from you to him. Now, I want to give you a definition of what I think grace is. I took this from the Baker's Dictionary of Theology, page 257. I want you to listen to this. I think it's pretty good. Of all I read, this was probably the better one, except for my own. <laughs> the essence of the doctrine of grace is that God is for us. What is more, he is for us who in ourselves are against him. Still more, he is not for us merely in a general attitude but has effectively acted toward us. Grace is summed up in the name Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Do you want to mind a little, little dippy? Grace is the unsought, unbought activity of God in Christ. The unsought, unbought activity of God in Jesus Christ. Now I want to go through quickly three, three theological significant statements. And I want to do it in three parallels. Three things in three categories. This is, this is them. Number one, God is for us. God is for us in Christ. God is transforming us into Christ's likeness. Now, grace is all three of those. God's attitude, it's God's action, and it's God manifesting his attributes in his children. Attitude, action, attributes. God is for us. God is for us in Christ. 
God is transforming us into Christ's likeness. Now, to lock that down biblically, I want you to turn to the fourth chapter of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. I hear those pages turning. 1 John chapter 4. God is for us, chapter 4, verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Number two, God is for us in Jesus Christ, verses 9 and 10. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is transforming us into Christ's likeness. Verse 11 and 7. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God is for us. He's for us in Christ. And he wants to make Christ's likeness in us. Grace covers all the Christian life. It covers all of eternity, past and future. Grace is the attitude of the Creator. Grace is the action of Jesus Christ. Calvary is the picture of the how far God will go in his love. The empty tomb is a picture of how powerful the love is. And the ascension is the promise that the love is coming back again. Grace. Grace is an attitude and an action of the triune God moving toward a transformed community. Will you bow your head with me, please? Will you sing with me this one song as we pray together? Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. As we continue to pray, I'm going to ask you if you're here and you have never, never accepted the love of God in Jesus Christ, but you feel that still small voice of God calling to you, saying, I love you. Come unto me through my Son. That's the Holy Spirit. This is God's day for you. Right now, the Spirit of God is speaking to many hearts who have never personally received Jesus Christ, never volitionally transferred their faith from their own goodness totally to Him apart from us. Oh, Christian, don't grow weary in well-doing. In due season, we shall reap if we faint not. God is for us. God is for us. God is for us. Jesus is for us. The Holy Spirit is for us. We've got it made, child of God. Hang in there. Hang in there. Daryl, know that we've been with him if we love one another. I pray the Spirit of God has spoken to you today and that you'll respond.